Um, so now it's time for our roundtable discussion. I'd like to bring together a while speakers back. And maybe I'll start with a question for Stuart. Um, in your presentation, you branded the, um, can you talk about the brand or the volume of air, air turnover, the filter, uh, portable air cleaners that were used um, and compared to the size and the, 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 the size of the room and the size of the house. Um, mm -hmm. And then also any um, comments on like dra any draft issues or noise reported from the, the user and then is that, and how has that impacted the behavior and perception of the people using the air filters? Okay, um, you can hear me? Yep. Good. Okay, um, so the systems that we bought were all one style. They were rated, I believe, at 300 or so CFM um, in terms of uh, clean air delivery rate or volumetric flow, roughly about the same. Um, the were, these were placed in the field study that I mentioned um, inside a bedroom for the child in these older homes. A typical home here would have smaller bedrooms than what you would expect. And so it was somewhat oversized. Um, and the um, unit had four speeds. And so we encouraged folks to use a higher speed, but they could do what they wanted. In any event, um, because the system was quite large, even running it on a lower speed would provide a good number of air changes per hour in the space. And that's evident by the large reductions that we did see when uh, testing in situ performance. The simulation exercise that I used or that we used where we were estimating the potential health benefits in terms of asthma and asthma symptoms use the same configuration. Um, but in addition, we placed a second similar unit in the living room. And the living rooms are more typical size, perhaps uh, uh, 300 square feet or 400 square feet, something like that. So, um, you know, we also allowed that to vary um, using the Monte Carlo method so that we made a system that potentially would be more representative and not represent just a single case. Uh, you know, one advantage of a larger unit is that you can run it at a lower speed and potentially have less noise as well with these units. So um, I, I think smaller units would have been uh, somewhat technically more acceptable because they take up less space. Um, and if you have a quiet unit, then obviously that can be advantageous. In terms of complaints associated with draft and drafts and noise, I would say um, a roughly a third of the respondents would mention that to us, something on that order of magnitude. So a non-trivial number of folks um, didn't appreciate those attributes of, of this technology. Yeah, and, and I think that's a follow-up question along those same line, like getting to sustained behavioral change is very difficult and just dropping off a, a portable air cleaner in someone's house and you don't get a lot of use is perhaps not that surprising that we don't see this. So like, is there any thoughts of follow-up studies or how do we improve the sustained nature of uh, encouraging usage? Right, so I, I think characterizing it as just dropping it off is not quite what we did. We recognize that we had a trained community health worker, someone from the neighborhood, established good rapport with the households, explained every visit, what was going on, um, saw these folks um, probably about 10 times over the study, um, perhaps every couple of months, but every uh, visit involved a, a deployment and a retrieval, and this person was often there. Um, and so there was a real attempt to provide uh, education and um, engagement. And certainly our experience is that folks do understand what PM 2.5 is. 
and they understand the significance of the uh, air cleaner on removing the PM and potentially improving health. This does not capture though, or does not reflect a behavioral change. Okay, and that's one of the points there that while providing information is helpful, perhaps essential, it's not the same as behavioral change. Right. Um, yeah, so in terms of follow-ups, that's a great question. And um, I think you heard with the other speakers, Lindsay, you know, that um, there's information presentations that might be more helpful than others. But I think it's a number of personal and community level factors are needed to encourage filter use. Um, one of the perhaps unrepresentative things about the particular application in Detroit was that these are financially very challenged households. And if I'm telling you that, you know, the uh, levelized cost is on the order of four to $500 for providing a filter per year, um, we cannot expect these individuals to pay that. And they would much rather address healthcare needs directly, food needs, fixing their car, whatever. And we have to be very sensitive, very sensitive to that. Um, beyond that, there are many people of means who go to the hardware store and buy the cheapest filter that's out there. And this is in part a problem with labeling and merchandising these units. And I think that there is an opportunity here for improvements in those regards. And earlier today, we had a brief discussion of MERV ratings and classifications, and it's a jungle right now with respect to what these filters actually do. And there are several competing systems and I don't understand them completely either. So I think that's one very simple thing that could be done, um, maybe not so simple. In, in terms of um, some of the psychological aspects or the behavioral change aspects, um, I'm uh, thinking also at the end of my presentation, I mentioned a few types of information and a couple of systems that might be used to encourage folks to act on the information that they get. Um, but this has not been, uh, we have not tested that ourselves. Thank you. Well, another question from the audience for Lindsay. Um, how did social, cultural factors and background play into your selection of participants? And then how do you formulate the visuals and integrate some of your results? And can you um, talk a little bit more about how you account for the social cultural variation? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, for full transparency with the particular research that I presented to you all, those participants were all participants within the Bay Area. So I, uh, I think that one of the really great things that this question is alluding to is another area of work that we have to consider when we're thinking about the individual differences of people. And that specifically has to do with our cultures. Um, and of course, like looking at culture, not just on a country level, but also within different regions of our countries um, across the world, because our thought too is, is that there are likely experiences due to your culture or due to the environment that you're like that you are used to living within that could also influence your perceptions. So for instance, this particular study is limited in the sense that we were looking at folks who had been living in the Bay Area where fire events are a regular occurrence um, and where most individuals are instructed at some point in time to pay attention to the air quality around them. But what is useful or what would be helpful in future work too is to look at if we could replicate those sorts of findings in other regions where air quality events are less likely to happen or something that people just don't have much experience with at all. Um, 
And then with regards to this particular study and how we're trying to investigate those questions and control for those things, we've also asked individuals what other locations they've lived besides the Bay Area so that we could try to start addressing those sort of cultural differences. Um, it's a limited sample size of 250-ish people. So there's that, but it should give us some sort of indication of those patterns. And then when we were actually doing the visualizations themselves, we looked at uh, visuals of air quality indexes from across the world. So from the US, Canada, the European Union, UK, China, and India, um, and looking at what were sort of the typical components of visuals that tended to be present um, from different government agencies. Uh, and we saw that there were kind of three broad things that tended to happen. There was often some sort of numeric index, uh, color coding, and then a qualitative or text-based description of what the environment was. So you saw that reflected in our visuals. And then something that was sort of more hit or miss across countries and government agency um, quantifying of air quality was this sort of health information. So some places do that, some places don't, and there's no sort of standardization um, as to how we present that. So that's what we were trying to begin to tackle, but um, there's a lot of work to still be done and certainly our culture and our environmental experiences as well as our environmental values are things that um, would likely impact how we interpret and perceive our spaces and our air quality. Great, thank you. So, um, sorry for not explaining this earlier, but um, we, well, hopefully Jeff and Elit and Brett are still around, if you are. Um, I plan to open up the floor in maybe five or 10 minutes so that we have uh, all six speakers together. But the next question I'll first go to Sarah. I think you mentioned something about we need um, indoor air, uh, indoor PM 2.5 guidance or uh, standards so the schools can follow. And I guess it's a little tie into what Lindsay is talking about. You know, we now have sensors in school and they can look at the number. And is it you're thinking about more towards how we help schools interpret those numbers and, and turns them into actions? Uh, yeah, so one of the things that we struggle with uh, on wanting trying to get folks to upgrade their HVAC systems or, or implement plans to clean their indoor air is there's no requirement right now that they do so. Um, the current commercial standard for buildings for their HVAC system for their filtration is just a number eight. Um, there is no requirement for monitoring indoor PM. Now on that end the lower cost sensors really need <clears throat> to get more reliable and more easy and user friendly um, for schools to Look and rely on that, but there is nothing requiring schools to have cleaner indoor air for their students or their employees. But we still have, yet you know, we have all this health research showing how important clean indoor air is um, to student success. Um, and so we need to get to this place where we actually require cleaner indoor air, uh, so we can see the types of changes that that we need. Um, because having everything be voluntary, um, folks find other uses for their money. Right. Um, so then uh, I'm going to open up the floor to invite speakers from the morning session who's still hanging around um, to answer some of the border questions. I think today we focus a lot on filtrations and now uh, we see a lot of you know, new, newer technology being coupled with filtration. We see in, inside of portable air cleaners, we see UV added to, to uh, filter, we see uh, a button for ionization added to part of the air filters and I've seen air, portable air clean filters coupled with uh, uh, photo catalytic oxidation. So all these like packaged systems. So what's your view on the value of, you know, loading more things onto an air filtration um, and in terms of, um, you know, cleaning our uh, uh, indoor PM and also in, in, in for COVID concerns? Like open the floor and see who wants to jump in first. Maybe I'll take a quick stab at that. So uh, I call that the kitchen sink approach to air cleaners. And uh, I could summarize the evidence that none of that stuff has been demonstrated 
uh, to, to add anything of value. And in some cases, there can be negative consequences. Now, that doesn't mean that those technologies maybe don't have a place. Uh, it's just we lack evidence of efficacy. And I think because of the potential harm of some of the devices and some of the technologies out there, precautionary principle means we have to be careful. Can I jump in also sure. uh, echoing something Jeff, or I think Jeff, somebody mentioned this morning. Uh, uh, first of all, the, the simple stuff works. Basic filtration, as long as you can ensure you're getting the filtration and that involves making sure that the air is moving through the filter, the filter works well. Um, one of the really nice things about the portable air cleaners is that if you get one that has a rating, you can go and, and um, AHAM test them and puts ratings on online. Uh, so you can get a verified certified rating. Uh, you plug it in and if you operate it at the set speed, you, you can pretty much know what you're getting. Uh, and then if you can combine that, so, so you don't have to worry about bypass or anything else. They're, they're very simple devices. Simple is really good. And um, they do cost something, but a lot of them are actually much more, are more efficient to operate. Uh, there was this point about cost and, and the cost per you know, CFM of clean air for a portable is much less than for your central, in most cases, your central furnace, in addition to all the problems that Jeff brought up. So uh, that it's, you're moving, you're, you're, you're spending a lot of energy to move air through a whole HVAC system and cooling coils, et cetera. And if you have the portable, especially if you have a smaller place, right? We talked about equity, so that's a good way for people renters you can buy it bring it into your apartment if you're in a smaller place they work better you don't need as many so s simple is better i think you know get a simple solution that you know works and and use it um, as as Stu, uh professor batterman brought up uh, i think is is the magic solution yeah if i could chime in um this is not the conventional thinking I am dealing with city and state governments that believe plasma units work. And it is very challenging to convince them, especially when communities are saying, you have to reduce VOCs or the virus. And so this message is not getting out there. Thank you. Um, I see, Rich, do you want to jump in and, 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 and make a comment? I know. Yeah, sure. I, I, the comment, I just put a comment in there for everyone, but I just wanted to say that when you really break down the, the, the financial requirements for good portable HEPA filtration in a classroom, it works out for a typical classroom of 25 students to be something on the order of $10 per student per year, right? Two grande frappuccinos per student per year. Compare that with the fact that we spend $15,000 per year to educate a student. The benefits for those two grande frappuccinos per, per student, I would argue, is huge. And I think we don't talk enough about the cost on a student basis. And, and if we talked more about that, I think we would grab more attention. Just maybe maybe comments on that from, from from anybody, you know, I hear from school districts that it's it's all about money. It is all about money. That's what I hear repeatedly. And when you break it down to a per student basis, that money doesn't seem to be that much. Uh, I, I, I sorry, jump in again, but Rich, I think it's an excellent point. And and getting back to all the other prior discussion about the the challenges related to operation and maintenance, et cetera, procurement. Um, this is one of the also easier solutions for a district because you could do it with mass procurement and it doesn't require going in and, 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 and trying to do some upgrade on a system that was installed 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, so it's, it's a quick solution, it's affordable, and then the maintenance is very simple, which is you know replacing the air filter every however long it needs. And... Uh, you know, putting a little sticker on the air cleaner that uh, when the filter was replaced. Uh, so it is, um, I, 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 Rich, I think your point is, is a great one. And, and we all need to maybe keep hammering away at that, that sometimes 
the simple solution is the best solution. Great. Um, there is also some comments from the audience worrying about, um, you know, the higher the MRF rating, and, and it's thinking about a home scenario, uh, the higher the MRF rating, um, worry about pressure drop, and wor worrying about the energy cost, and worry about if my older furnace can can handle that, that kind of high MRF filters. Um, I think there are probably practical advice that Jeff, you can, you can uh, share with us. But also, like broadening that question a little bit, if um, upgrading filtration is a systemic solution that a lot of homes can 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 do, think about in terms of a, a retrofit scenarios. So if you can comment on that. So I will comment that certainly low flow is a problem in a lot of central forced air heating and cooling systems. Um, but I would further argue that the filter is rarely the cause of that. Uh, constricted returns, meaning there's not enough airflow through the negative pressure return side of the system, is the cause of that. And so um, the real answer here, and practical issues aside, is fix the fundamental problem with the system uh, and then put in a good filter. Practically, though, I would caution people about there's this assumption that a better filter, a more efficient filter has a higher pressure drop. And that's not borne out by the evidence. And it turns out to be kind of a complicated question. But I would say that there's lots of practical solutions. So if you're already going to be putting in a better filter slot to address bypass issues, then making sure that filter slot is gasketed well uh, so, and, 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 and thick. Uh, meaning it can accommodate a two inch or a four inch filter, which will have a lower pressure drop and will provide uh, the performance. Um, the last comment I would make on the kind of general issue is that I think it's another issue that ties to other things we've heard today and throughout the workshop, that there's this kind of education issue. And that education issue extends to homeowners and people who operate schools, but as well as people actually doing the installation themselves, that there are solutions to this issue. Uh, and it's very often an indication of a much bigger problem. Yeah, if I'd like to step in and make two comments also. Um, first is many schools don't have air conditioning and providing effective filtration when your window is open uh, is very challenging if they're using natural ventilation. Um, and I forget my second point. <laughs> well, anybody wants to chime in? Otherwise, I have a related thought. Um, I think some of what we hear from day one and, and maybe even day two is um, the idea that, um, you know, uh, reducing infiltration from outdoor is also a, a strategy that we didn't get to talk so much about. Um, we are focusing on, you know, uh, uh, filtration and also, uh, you know, for cooking, arrange it. What's your thoughts on um, on focusing more on reducing infiltration or a tighter building envelope as a way to mitigate our exposure to outdoor PM? Yeah, Renji, if I could yeah, just sure. follow up because it's a great segue for your question. Sure. Um, with respect to schools, our studies have, and we've looked at dozens of schools, have shown chronic problems with lack of ventilation, inadequate ventilation for the capacity of the space. And so going back to what I think Jeff has argued, you know, this has to be fixed too. Thanks, anyone want to comment on the infiltration idea or opportunities? Well, it's certainly a good idea if you are looking at your home to find leaks you can seal up, especially if it's going to be really poor outdoor air quality. That's one message to get out there is if you want to have safer indoor air and outdoor air is, is uh, heavily polluted, then yeah, go and, and do those assessments, do good weatherization to, to create that seal. Um, the trade-off then is if you have a really well-sealed house, the human-generated uh, particulate matter is going to be trapped inside with you. Um, so you have to be cognizant of um, your own creation of, of indoor pollution that is going to be stuck in there with you. So really clean your air. 
Um, but but geo-lock your home is a good idea too. And I guess I'll follow up with just again sort of hammering home that education piece, helping the public understand how their behaviors and um, their daily actions are really influencing their indoor air quality. I mean, that's central to all of these issues that we're talking about because that's going to dictate success or not of how we continue to engage with those spaces regardless of the building intervention. Yeah, and I see one other uh, related question is on the chemical compositions of particles from wildfire, but I guess also from, you know, Ilya talk about uh, neuro emissions. So how effective are these filtration technology as we face with different types of PM? Did you, yeah. yeah I, I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, I think the primary determinant of the uh, removal efficiency is the, you know, the uh, particle diameter, so the the size of the particle you're looking to remove by the the filter, and so I think you know looking at that practically, an upside is that um, if you install a filtration intervention, it can be effective for particles from different sources if they have that you know similar dimension, that similar particle size that can be removed by that intervention. So you know our intervention at a school that's targeting ultrafine particles, black carbon, and is also effective across the whole range of fine particulate matter, should also then be effective for, you know, other sources that fall in that same size range. Great. Um, it's, I don't know. Benji, yeah, sure. Another point about the organics that I think um, re maybe requires some more research, which is uh, if everyone does what we're suggesting, and improves either central filtration or uses portable air cleaners, there are these wildfire smoke events. Uh, what will happen is they will collect a bunch of organics on their filters. Uh, they will get to have the benefit of cleaner air throughout the wildfire smoke event. Uh, and then as soon as the uh, smoke abates uh, and they're running their air cleaner, um, they will notice that their house now smells smoky uh, or their school or their, you know, wherever they are. Uh, so, so, I, and and I, I think it's still somewhat unclear how, how much of a risk those organic loaded filters present. Uh, certainly, if they're you know throwing open the windows and they're bringing in a lot of ozone, uh, you could get ozone reacting with some of those uh, deposit organics. It's it's certainly unpleasant. Uh, and and the, the reality is, uh, while I, I obviously a big fan of these portable air cleaners, uh, the filter replacements are not cheap. Uh, so uh, the question of when you really do need to replace the filter, uh, whether it is an unpleasant thing, maybe it's something that you could actually regenerate the filter by operating it in a well-ventilated space or you know outside or something when it's a nice day, uh, blow off some of the organics uh, and then have that filter for you know because the, the the particle they, they do have pre-filters a lot of them so the particle capture may be fine for some period of time if you can get rid of the organics. So the, I think there's some refinements that we need uh, uh, to, to go beyond the, the simple, okay, put the for, filter in and, and, and um, operate it. Um, one other uh, point, uh, this is a point we discussed in planning for this with Sarah. Uh, I think in terms of the uh, education, there is something, again, there's the, the first level is pretty simple, but beyond that, in terms of how people will manage um, either their home or their school as you have these events, right? So you have a sustained wildfire event. It's, it's easy enough to say, stay inside. When, when it starts, as Sarah mentioned, going for two or three weeks, uh, then it becomes, I think, a real burden. And then finding ways to get outside so people aren't feeling like they're trapped in their homes for three or four weeks uh, during a fire season of, of understanding when there are breaks in the smoke, things like that, that they can get out maybe with a mask and, and, and get some experience being outside. So there, there are, I think there are some second order or second level communications and guidance that we need to work on. But uh, until we get kind of first take care of that thing where we help establish that people can be safe in the environments where they are. Again, one more quick point that Sarah brought up, I think it was an excellent one, that uh, the, the sensors are fine. And I think for cooling, right, for like uh, uh, big heat events, 
uh, you need sometimes to have those cooling centers because getting air conditioning into everybody's house is going to be a much bigger lift. Uh, but for the filtration, we can certainly do it. So, Great. Um, any final comments from our speakers today? No, thank you so much for your presentation, the thoughtful discussion, and it's time to bring up Rich Corsi, who's our chair, to wrap up the workshop.